Let me tell you a story about a user researcher who's at the very end of a round of research. They got the brief, they got clear on the research questions and goals, they made sure the right participants were recruited, they ran the round of research, they anal analyzed the results, and now all that's left is to give the findings to the team. So they do that with a cool yet concise presentation. They invite all the relevant stakeholders. They deliver the key findings with cool graphics. And then they ride off to the sunset to do more research while the team goes back to make the greatest game ever. But sometimes they do wonder what happened with the round of research. Were the findings ever used? Following up on a specific round of research isn't always done. This depends on the culture that you're in, the, um, the environment that you're working in, if it's in studio or if you're working in an out with an outsourcer or something. But even when you are in a situation where you do follow up and can talk to the team afterwards, it's not that uncommon to find that not all the research findings had the impact that you really hoped. There are very tight deadlines in game development, um, which force them to make difficult decisions. There are always very pressing issues, and sometimes the ones that you found get trampled by other ones. Often, findings are left to wait for a better time that never comes, and sometimes they are plain old forgotten before anyone can even think about what to do with them. Whenever this happens, our researcher vows to make better presentations in the future. They will tell a story and paint a picture that touches on the feelings of the, um, of the de development team. Or they will have the data speak for itself. And they, of course, will spend time finding allies, evangelizing user researchers, and making the ground more fertile for the research findings to land in the future. Whatever they do, they will do and be better in the future, so their research findings will have a better impact. Because a presentation is the best way to deliver the findings, isn't it? This is the learning pyramid that has been shared a lot, at least lately, in um, learning circles. It basically states that the more active you are in using the information that you're trying to learn, the easier it is for you to recall it afterwards. So if someone just tells you something, you are 5%, like uh, you will remember 5% of what was told. Um, whereas if you're told something, you actively use that information and say, teach each others, you're more likely to recall a lot more of it. Here it says 90%. There is some question to the actual numbers because the original study is lost to time. But there are other theories such as multimodal learning that support the general sentiment of you wanting to be more involved and using more senses when you're trying to learn if you want to recall it better uh, in the future. So for us, this brings us to workshops. They are a more active way for people to process information than just a presentation. Uh, there are multiple ways to interpret the word workshop, from a physical space to different kind of group activities. So I want to go over what I mean when I talk about them here. Uh, when I say a workshop, I mean an interactive session where the workshop, uh, workshop facilitator ensures that the participants are presented with the relevant information and are then guided through collaborative activities so that the workshop leads to the desired result. Basically, what that means is that our researcher slash um, facilitator will present the data to the team, guide the team through a set of activities that help them draw the right conclusions. As the work and the conclusions are done by the team, they are more likely to act upon them afterwards and 
remember them, if nothing else. But wait, 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 wait. Step back a little. Did I just say that the researcher will have the team do all the work and draw the right conclusions? That's delegation in a weird way. And if you want them to draw the right conclusions, isn't that insincere? Isn't that you driving the conclusions and making them making sure that they end up in the right place? I mean, there's a word for that, and that word is manipulation. As researchers, we spend a lot, and I mean a lot of time, building trust between us and the game teams that we work with. Manipulating them would undermine all of that. Why would anyone do that? And that's a fair question. Manipulation is definitely not something that we want to do here. That should not be at the heart of workshopping at all. What we should be aiming for instead is guidance. You as the researcher and the facilitator are an expert of research and what is happening in the workshop. They, on the other hand, are experts of the game and their craft. So what you will do is guide them through the steps of seeing what's in the data, because that is what you know best. You will help them to avoid biases and assumptions as well as blind spots, because that is also something that you're ver versed in. And in general, you're there to give a structured way for them to process the information that you're giving them. The team, on the other hand, then can take their expertise and draw the conclusions that they feel are best for the game based on their knowledge as well as the information that you've now given them. Okay, I don't know about you because this is pre-recorded, but our researcher is convinced. So they go to the supply closet and rate it for all the different colored sticky notes that they can find tons of sharpies, at least enough to go around to everyone, and preferably some extra just in case some of them die. Um, different colored stickers, small stickers for voting, as well as index cards for note taking and general writing down of ideas. They will also ensure that there are whiteboards in the meeting room and improvise if not. They can be stuck to the wall, they can be mo moving around like the one that's here on legs, or it can be just big sheets of paper that are taped to the wall. And of course, nowadays it's very common to run hybrid or remote workshops. So it's equally possible to set up a board in Miro, FigJam, Jamboard, or any other online whiteboard equi equivalent. Anything that sets the stage for the workshop to come. So, this round of research was on onboarding. There is a bunch of short videos that, um, of players going through the onboarding. The researcher deems that they are short enough and there are only a few of them, so it's worth everyone's time to watch them together. So what they do is book the meeting room, invite the team in, do some warm-up exercises to get them in the groove of like talking together and not just being in a presentation. They will also explain what's happening so people's expectations are set correctly and they won't be freaked out when they actually have to do stuff. And then they hand out stickies and sharpies and hit play on the first video. As the team watches the videos, they write down their thoughts, observations and so on on sticky notes. The rule is, one idea or observation per sticky note, and the other rule is this is done mostly in silence. There are some hoots of laughter and groans when something unexpected happens, but mostly people are very good at just writing things down silently. Once the videos are over and everyone is done writing, the sticky notes are stuck on a whiteboard in no particular order. Then there's a moment where people can look at what others wrote to see how reliant they are. Here is an awkward moment when our researcher sees that a potentially big issue hasn't been mentioned at all in any of the sticky notes. And this is where we come into a fundamental um, definition and rift between 
what the facilitator is and is not allowed to do. There are some who feel that they should be a note taker only and focus on that and give that their full attention and not try to participate in the activities at all. Whereas others are more lenient. The way I set things up is that they are an expert not only in what's happening in the workshop, but also blind spots and biases. So I am a proponent of when they see there's an issue being missed, they should voice that. So they rock up to the researcher, um, not researchers, but the team, and they ask, oh, by the way, did you see when player three did this? Is that okay? Or should that be on the board? And it might be that it is completely fine and they were misunderstanding, or it might be that everyone just missed it because of various reasons. Someone was just grabbing their drink, someone else was writing another note and just not paying attention. But whatever the uh, end result is, the team is still in control of whether the sticky note ends up on the wall or not, but the researcher also ensures that nothing is dropped by accident. This usually um, ends up with there being a lot of stickies on the wall and just looking at those is very overwhelming. So it's good to group them together. Um, this is done now in a way that the team gets to sit back while the researcher does all the legwork. They read the stickies out loud and move them next to the appropriate ones. The team can then comment whether or not that was correct. This is not a game show or anything, this is a collaborative exercise, but this also makes sure that everyone knows what's happening and there are no surprises. Sometimes there are sticky notes that are hard to understand because maybe the handwriting isn't the best, the, sti uh, the sharpie was bleeding, or there is now no context because there is time passed from when the sticky was written. But because the team is there, uh, they can usually be sorted out and the sticky can find its home. The groupings usually kind of evolve during this exercise. First, they're grouped one way. Sometimes it's realized that, no, actually these two groups belong together, or this group should be broken down into um, a couple of different groups. So at the end, it should be um, checked that the groupings are correct and that they're labeled correctly, so it's easier to refer to them. Again, during the labeling, the team should be in charge of making sure of decide, of, that they decide which group um, consists of which sticky notes, but the facilitator can help them phrase the um, labels in the clearest, most helpful way. While the categories are a great starting point for discussion, sometimes it's helpful to map the stickies in a different way as well. There are multiple ways of doing this, such as user journey maps, even empathy maps, or other flows. And because this time they were going over the onboarding of the experience, uh, the researcher figures that user journey map is the most helpful mapping that they can do. So they take the stickies and they put them um, on this user journey map based on the different beats in this, uh, the onboarding. This helps them visualize the timing of different issues. It might help them realize how likely these are to happen. And also if there are any issues that are clustering together so they can either find that these are unrelated issues that are happening together that are forming a problematic situation together. Or it might be that there is one issue that then causes all these others. And this first one might be the most important to figure out and fix. But whichever is the case, having them visualize like this is usually very helpful. Again, we come to the unfortunate truth that there's never enough time in game development to address everything. So the researcher gives each uh, team member uh, five dots, dot stickies, that they can put on the most important issues that they've identified so far. They can put them however they want 
it can be decided that they can put all of them on one issue if they want to, they can spread them out, but they have to put them so again there's a visual way of identifying what is deemed as the most important issue. After that, it, you, it is usually uh, important to have yet another discussion of what was happening because people are from different, different disciplines and have different perspectives on why things are important. So it might be that programmers only um, vote for something that other people don't feel are, is a very big deal, but then during the discussion it turns out that there's a huge back-end issue that changing that would fix tons of other issues or maybe introduce new ones. And as a group they decide that no, actually this might be the most important issue after all. Or it might be that, uh, which is more often the case, the one with most votes is the most important and should be tackled first. Because there are some major issues in the onboarding that they've now discovered, the researcher and the facilitator figure out that maybe we should find a common understanding of what the new and improved ideal um, onboarding uh, experience should now be. So they have the team storyboard very quickly, very rough drafts, a storyboard of what should happen in the new onboarding um, experience. As there are some shy people who really don't like to talk in big crowds, uh, the facilitator figures out that everyone will first work on their storyboard alone, then they will discuss their own storyboards in smaller groups to find understanding of what they feel is most important, and only then will they come together as a big group to form the ultimate storyboard. And once the storyboard is done, it's good to check it for blind spots and biases. The team is very experienced, but everyone, even us, even them, have blind spots and assumptions that they make. But luckily, this team has made uh, archetypes of players beforehand, so those can be whipped out, and now the team is broken into smaller groups, uh, with each one taking on a role of one archetype, where they discuss whether the new um, onboarding experience is taking into account all their needs and wants. Once they've had that discussion, they come together as a team once again, and each group will share their thoughts and insights that they made during the role-playing session. The facilitator can kind of sit back here and just take notes, but they're ready to step in if there are any um, assumptions that they want to address or highlight. After they're done, the team walks away with all the new ideas um, and insights that they had during this day and they have the whiteboard either as a physical version or as an image or a website that they can re uh, refer back to in their day-to-day -day job later on. This was a completely made up and frankly a bit unrealistic scenario to highlight some of the most common exercises and methods used at workshops. We didn't go into very much detail on any of the things because there are different variations of each. Um, we also did not touch upon the fact that there are different philosophies behind different types of workshops depending on your cultural and professional background among other things, but we only had 20 to 25 minutes so Bear with me. I do hope that this gave you an idea of what a workshop could look like and whether or not it could be helpful in your job and your team, as well as to give you an idea of what the guiding part of facilitating a workshop means. At the very least, I do hope that you don't think running a workshop is manu uh, manipulating everyone, anyone. There are tons of resources online to help you get started, as well as to pick specific activities for your workshops. Again, depending on what you want to do and focus on will guide you in what kind of activities you choose. Um, a quick internet search will get you very far, but here are a few things that I feel are great to get you started. There are different resources to understanding 
just the general framework of what a workshop is, different activities of what you could do, as well as how to set it up and what to think about beforehand and afterwards as well. Most of these are websites, but there's also a great book that you can check, check out. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to chat to you about your experiences of workshops, whether you've run them yourself or participated in one, or answer any questions that you might have about workshops. Feel free to reach out to me through chat or social media. I'm very easy to find on LinkedIn and Twitter. Twitter alternatives, not so much, as I barely have the energy to be active on Twitter, although I technically do have accounts there as well. And if you like the art style of these slides and are interested in how UX is and can be baked into game development, I share my knowledge and ideas on Instagram under the account exbquest with graphics that look very similar to ones you've seen here. I'd very much appreciate if you give me a follow and if you have any ideas of what I should feature there, I'd be all ears. Thank you very much.